like to recognise the traditional owners before I start. Uh, I'd also like to say, given that I wasn't the original speaker, that I didn't actually get the guidelines. So there are a few things in here that may tweak a few emotions. Um, I hope that is the case. I don't want to go too far along that line, but um, firstly, my name, John Featherston. Uh, my family has resided in this area since the 1880s, so we have a long history with the Coffs Harbour area. I own two of Australia's leading recreational fishing publications, Spearfishing Down Under and Fish Life magazine. I own a spearfishing equipment distribution business, and I'm also on the New South Wales Recreational Fishing Trust Saltwater Expenditure Committee. Uh, for those who are unaware, the Recreational Fishing Trust manages funds from the Recreational Fishing Licence in New South Wales. Now each year, approximately $13 million comes from recreational fishing, and my role as a committee member is to basically allocate the expenditure from that funding. I'd like to speak a little bit more on that later, but if I get time, that would be great. So um, before I touch on spearfishing, um, the most sustainable and ecological form of fishing, I hope you'll indulge me for a few minutes to recount a little bit of history from a spearfishing perspective and perhaps highlight our current position and the emotions connected to that. So to quote a philosopher, those who cannot learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Pretty simple. If you don't learn your lessons, you're going to repeat them. Secondly, I make reference to the first point on the distribution of the flow of this forum to provide an opportunity to provide a broad range of participants to listen respectfully to each other. Listen respectfully. To be honest, I was struck by the irony of that comment when I read it. We have seen nearly a two decade long campaign by the Marine Park Authority and the National Parks Association in a relentless, uncompromising, politically driven campaign of establishing marine parks. I have another of other descriptive nouns, but it would have been a little wordy, so I'm just going to leave it at that. So now, it's a little bit ironic also that those who pride themselves on a pacifistic and compassionate nature have been the bully in the marine park debate. Debate is probably the wrong word, because that actually infers there was two sides to the argument. So now you want us to listen respectfully. So it begs the question, what has changed? Why now? Why do the MPA and the MPA seek to mend the bridges they have damaged with recreational fishers? Why now seek repentance? Perhaps a metaphor will serve best to illustrate. You remember the school bully? Being an academic, I remember him all too well. He used his position of strength to further his own cause without regard for others. I also fondly remember the day when he was brought crashing down to earth and how soon afterwards he also sought repentance. As the Greens are cast the political wilderness in New South Wales by New South Wales voters, potentially for many years, the analogy between the demise of the school bully and then become all too apparent. The loss of political power, the rise of the recreational fisher as a political force, has been a long time coming, but is now here in New South Wales and it spreads across the rest of Australia. Indeed, the rise of all outdoor loving people and their need to be heard. Unfortunately, many political parties on both sides at state and federal level continuing with their blinding arrogance to ignore the uprising to their detriment. So all we have ever asked for is that you listen respectfully to us, to the recreational fishers and address the real issues that affect our marine estate. Water quality, catchment management, urban and industrial runoff, introduced species, illegal fishing, but no, you have chosen to target and ostracise the recreational fisher. Well, I refer back to my opening comment. What have recreational fishers learned from history and are we doomed to repeat it? Well, apathy has led to an imbalance of power and the current state of play, but let me assure you, we have learned our lessons and the stark daily reminder of our past apathy is the marine park system we have in New South Wales. A system that really does not cater for recreational fishing and it does very little for recreationally targeted species. It serves to exclude recreational fishers but still give access to the scuba diving industry under the guise of protecting biodiversity an industry that will go to extraordinary lengths to ensure their self-serving commercial interests are protected at the cost of ordinary Australians. 
So the time comes for recreational fishers to make a choice. Do we take the power granted and abuse it, as the Greens have done in the past, or do we listen respectfully? Well, I'm here today, and that's a good start. But it's fair to say that there's little respect and credibility between the relationship between recreational fishers and the Greens under whatever guise you take care to call yourselves and the way you've conducted yourself over the past two decades. And the great tragedy of this is really the core principles of national parks, marine parks and recreational fisher are analogous. Protecting our marine ecosystems for future generations. However, your decision to use the marine parks as a political football and a political tool of leverage has been disastrous. The real loser is the process and ultimately the marine environment that process sets out to protect. Is there a way forward? Of course, there's always a way forward. And it's my firm belief that the token days of consultation, as they have been called in the past, are over. So we come to the table with lessons learned from history, tempered with a healthy dose of scepticism, and a mandate from the people of New South Wales. So you want to talk to us? Fine, let's talk. And we will, unlike the National Parks Association and Marine Parks in the past, listen respectfully. But let's keep the focus on positive outcomes for the marine estate, rather than kicking the heck out of the political football. If we maintain focus, I know that finally real progress will be made in ensuring fishing access for our children and positive outcomes for the marine estate, because the two are not mutually exclusive. I'd like to move on and talk about spearfishing, and specifically spearfishing in the context of the Saltry Island Marine Park. I searched the thesaurus for an appropriate expression, but I just keep coming back to the words screwed over. And a little insight into the art of spearfishing, because you need to understand how devastating this marine park has been access-wise for spearfishermen. Spearfishing is done on breath hole. What does that mean? It is illegal to spearfish on scuba or with any form of underwater breathing apparatus. Repeat, illegal. So you have a single breath of air. Ask yourself, how long can you stay underwater on a single breath of air? How deeply can you dive? I hope you're starting to realise just how limiting spearfishing is. For most spearfishers, water deeper than 10 metres is out of the question. For my son, who's 10 years old, 3 metres and deeper is out of the question. A few statistics, so I promised myself I wouldn't bore you senselessly with statistics because there are plenty of other people who probably do that today. But, marine park, our marine park, 720 square kilometres. Total area of reef. Now this has changed, as I pre-swath mapping has shown us more reef, roughly 10%. Total area of reef less than 15 metres, so we're giving you 15, not 10, approximately 2.9%. 20% of that is in sanctuary zones. So we're down to 2.3. Now as Dr Smith alluded to, that a good part of the year the water on the coast is dirty, and a lot of that shallow reef is made up in coastal areas. So I refer now to the mid-shelf and offshore reef of less than 15 metres. It makes up 0.6% of this marine park, of which 60% is in sanctuary zones. So we're now down to one quarter of 1% of offshore waters that are available to spearfishing. So the MPA espoused that only a small percentage of the marine park is sanctuary. However, when you realise that water deeper than 10 metres is out the reach of most spearfishermen, when you realise that shallow water and shallow reef headlands are dirty and unsafe a lot of the year, when you realise any sort of swell makes them undoverable, you come to understand that you cannot spearfish at night, both impossible and illegal. When you realise that visibility below five metres, spearfishing becomes not only difficult, but unpleasant and unsafe. I will go on and limb and say that even my learned scientific colleague here will agree the water quality in the Solitary Islands has been severely degraded in the last two years, a combination of abysmal runoff protection from the highway duplication and excessive rain. Where was the MPA on that issue? They seemed extraordinarily quiet. Perhaps your time was being consumed with anti-fishing campaigns. I digress. I think you're starting to understand challenges of spearfishing and how challenging it can be and how devastating it is when those very limited areas defined as diveable are locked up. I open today by saying that spearfishing was one of the most ecologically and sustainable forms of fishing. Well, what does that mean? Spearfishing has no bycatch. 
Zero, all but zero equipment loss. We target specific size and species of fish. You cannot spear a whole school of fish. In most instances, you'll be lucky to get one or two fish out of a school, and then they spook and they're gone. Remember, you have one shot, and if you're successful, you'll be attached to that fish until you land him. Then you'll need to reload. So a good terrestrial analogy, if you will indulge me, imagine you're a conservation hunter trying to shoot an entire mob of feral pigs that are destroying our national parks with a single gun with which you can take a single shot and it takes you two minutes to reload. There are some species that are more susceptible to spearfishing. Blue groper is a good example. But they're now totally protected and banned from spearfishing. I might add a ban that was instigated by spearfishermen due to their observed decline. They are now in plague proportions. Spearfishing is great for your health. It's a great workout. Spend a day in the water covering many kilometres with just a set of fins. A terrific workout. And with our children becoming lazier and fatter, and any pastime that engages them respectfully with the outdoors in an active way should be applauded. I would tend to my 10-year-old son knows more about the Solitary Island Marine Park than 99% of the people who live in Coffs Harbour. He has dived with numerous shark species, shot a few fish, and he, as I am, was mesmerised by the beauty of what he had seen. The respect and admiration he has developed for the marine estate through good role modelling is a real reward for me as a father. And I know he will continue to be a great ambassador. However, each trip is tempered with a deep sorrow about limited access he is now granted. Access that I grew up diving with my father, now gone. A very personal example, as a resident of Sandy Beach, flat top, a fantastic dive for young Spiros, full of fond memories for me as a boy with my dad, locked up and gone. The southern side of Bear Bluff, gone. Groper Island, gone. 40 acres, gone. Spearfishing ban in all estuaries, the perfect place to learn to spearfish. Yet you can still fish there. And why? What impact was spearfishing have on the species we target in those areas that couldn't be better managed by changes to fisheries regulation if it was necessary? I appreciate I'm probably running out of time, but the one thing that I would really like to touch on, and I think covers common ground with all of us, is the Recreational Fishing Licence Program and the trust that management. One word, brilliant. How many Greens actually know what the trust does? Very simply, it's responsible for the development of programs that enhance recreational fishing. There are some very obvious and visual programs, such as the FAD program, fish cleaning benches, fishing platforms, but I'd like to highlight some of the less visual programs that I know will strike a very positive chord with everyone in this room. And remember that these programs are funded in large part by recreational fishers in New South Wales. Funding for education programs, fish care volunteers. This is the flagship program of the Trust. Over 300 trained volunteers are involved in face-to-face -face education with anglers to help them familiarise themselves with fishing rules and to promote responsible fishing practices. Raising recreational fishing awareness. Provides information on fishing rules to anglers, encourages responsible and sustainable fishing practices through a range of media. Funding for habitat rehabilitation programs. There is currently nearly $1 million being spent by recreational fishers in New South Wales under the summary of aquatic habitat protection and rehabilitation. That sounds like a national parks program. Funded by recreational fishermen in New South Wales. Habitat action program called Making More Fish Naturally involves the development of a series of on-ground programs to improve habitat rehabilitation and fish stocks in consultation with catch and management authorities. Who'd have thought? Funding for research. Thank you. As many New South fishery scientists will test, and as Dr Smith alluded to, funding is drying up. The government's broke. Where does this money come from? A lot of this money is coming from recreational fishers in New South Wales. Improving survival and catch release methods. Game fish tagging to provide us valuable scientific information on the movement and growth of billfish, shark and tuna. Artificial reef monitoring programs. Profiling the biology and fishery of rock blackfish. Assessment of barra trauma and the mitigation managed on the behaviour and survival of offshore species. Fisheries biology and the movement of mangrove jack in New South Wales. Conducted in this very facility 
funded by, who else? New South Wales, recreational fishermen. There are plenty more terrific programs, and I implore you to visit the DPI website and have a look at the Rec Fishing Trust program and the programs currently under management, and the amount of money that is being spent in the enhancement and protection and rehabilitation of recreational fishing and fishing in general in New South Wales. The point I'm trying to make is that despite for years recreational fish has been treated as the enemy, we are not the enemy. We are putting our money where our mouth is, working on educating, researching and rehabilitating. And with a fast changing political landscape, the sleeping giant has awoken from its apathetic sleep and you will do well to hear my words when I say that change is coming and we will continue to drive change so that our marine parks truly reflect the desires of the majority of Australians and not just a few. Thank you.